I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week, Dan Lynch and I are joined by Sam Curran. Sam's an old friend who's been very active lately in the did and didcom worlds. If you don't know about this yet, you need to because this is probably the thing that's really going to replace uh, passwords and all that kind of authentication stuff. It's a much better way to do identity without having to present an ID all the time of some kind or depend on the giants. It's a really cool technology. He's also involved with Hyperledger Aries. We talk about Picos, which have been a subject on other shows, and he was one of the authors of. It's all really good stuff. A very, very action-packed show, and that's coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 685. Recorded Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. Dids and Didcom. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by IT Pro TV. Finally, you can enjoy getting an IT education with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use the code TWIT30 at checkout. And by NetFoundry. Reinvent the network and eliminate the WAN by decoupling security from infrastructure to protect applications and data with open source zero trust. Grab your free swag and free tier now by going to netfoundry.io slash twit. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly, and I am joined this week by the great Dan Lynch. There he is coming up hey, for Doc. those of you not, not visually impaired. And uh, those are... and. I noted earlier you have two instruments off to your your off your left shoulder. You have a a guitar and a keyboard there. I um, I do, yeah, I do currently have both. I can play the guitar a lot better than I can play the keyboard. I have to admit, but I'm working on the keyboard. It's it's in process. So, have you been playing since you were a kid? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I went to music college when I left school. Oh um, I was fortunate enough to, to qualify for music college. But even to this day, I still don't like writing and reading music as a, a written form. It doesn't really work for me, possibly because I'm dyslexic and I, I, you know, I have the same problem with words sometimes. But yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate that if I hear something, I can usually usually play it back. Yeah, yeah. And you know what key it's in? Can you usually guess the key? Do you have that? Roughly. I, yeah, roughly. I don't play anything and I can, I can often guess the key. And I don't know why. I, I have some of that ability, but I don't have the other. I, I'm, I'm a, I would have been a drummer if I didn't live in a house that wouldn't allow it, I think. Because uh, uh, I, 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 I drum on things. I'm, I'm the guy who had the tambourine. You're a rhythm man. Or the, I'm a rhythm man. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a, um, well, that's cool. So our guest this morning is, uh, is, is Sam Curran. AKA Telegram Sam in his various uh, online incarnations. I, I've known Sam a long time. I'm, I'm guessing he's new to you. Is that right? Yeah, we've never met before, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, you're, you're going to enjoy it because Sam is mm-hmm. one of my favorite geeks. And uh, <laughs> when I call on for things, and uh, I'm curious to see if he, if he will admit to having invented things that he doesn't give himself credit for. Mm. But first, I have to let everybody know, before we get into the show, that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide's a new take on endpoint management that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so much that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their personal laptops without telling anyone. In that scenario, everyone loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, 
Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state into a dynamic conversation, a conversation that starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like the screen lock not being set correctly to hard to solve and nuanced issues like asking people to secure two-factor backup codes sitting in their downloads folder properly. And because it's talking directly to employees, Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide, cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first for teams that Slack get endpoint management. That puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Visit kolide.com slash floss today and right now. You can get a goodie bag of Collide swag after signing up for a new trial as their way of saying thank you. Okay, our guest today is uh, is Sam Curran. I've known Sam a long time. I was trying to figure out before the show how long that is. It's been, I think, since he and I both worked separately, him, he on staff with a startup called Kinetics that was in, in, in Utah and... Um, and Sam was involved in inventing something there. I'd, actually, I might want to start out with that. I mean, Sam, you're you're kind of a geek of all purposes from way back, though you're not that old. Are you there? I'm looking for his picture up here on screen. There he is. <laughs> lit, lit from one side. Unlike the, the, those of us who have those USB ring things like I have that light us on both sides to make our wrinkles disappear. But you don't have those. Yet, I, so you're good. I don't have a cool microphone either. So if I, if I do more of these, maybe I'll have to step up my game. <laughs> So, so am, am I right that we met when you were at Kinetics? Is, uh... Yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, Phil Winley was one of the founders of Kinetics, and he was my grad advisor. And uh, a long story short, he he roped me into that, and I had a wonderful experience there. That's, so Phil has actually, I think, been on this this show at least once, maybe twice. Uh, he's a PhD computer scientist. Uh, uh, it's taught, and I think still teaches at BYU. So you were an undergrad there at that time. Uh, I was uh, at that time, uh, I, I was coming out of my graduate degree. So um, he was mm. my graduate advisor. And then uh, I towards the tail end of that, I started working for a startup as I was finishing the final paperwork on my on my master's degree. So, so, so I want to I want to go to what became Picos because we've talked about Picos a couple of times on here it stands for persistent compute objects. But I think you either invented or, or co-invented those as a way to help the university find the owners of lost bikes. Is that an apocryphal story? Is that the truth or what's that? Uh, that's, cl that's close enough to accurate that it's true, right? Um, there's some <laughs> nuance to that story. Um, the, the idea that we had was that uh, it would be great if things could have computing attached to them, even if they weren't. So even if they didn't have a microcontroller or, or, or a network connection, and and so the 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 incantation here was uh, was a QR code uh, on a on a sticker, and you can actually get uh, those made uh, as an asset tag, which means that they're like nice metal stickers or something that you can put. They're hard to remove. They've got great adhesive and things, and um, and they're it's like pretty scratch proof. And so it's it's better than just like you know a sticker out of your laser printer or something. But um, and then when you scan the QR code, you would have a web interface to the thing, and what kind of interface you got depended on whether you were the owner of the thing or not. Uh, if you uh, were the owner, you had a whole bunch of options and configurations. If you were not, then you could, you would be presented a screen that allowed you to contact the owner. The, the theory being is that if you found one of these things, you could scan it with your phone and, uh, and then contact the owner and say, Hey, I found your bike or whatever. And, uh, and then help them get their thing back. So the, uh, the basic the, idea. For those of you not visually impaired, again, I'm, I'm holding up my bag, my computer bag that I carry around when I'm uh, working. There's a QR code on here, and it says "safe and scan me, safe and mine." The, 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 and so I have one of these, and it actually still works with, um, uh, I think Pico Labs uh, at BYU or elsewhere because it's not just there. Um, maintains the code 
or maintains a, is kind of primarily responsible for it. But the interesting thing to me about that at that time, and I think this is a worthy topic, is that it was early in the period where we started talking about IoT, the Internet of Things, and the default assumption was that the Internet of Things had to be connected intelligent things, which is a really small subset of all the stuff we own. And the idea behind Picos then was, hey, anything you have can have um, a place on the internet that is not on the device, but looks different to, as you were just saying, to the person who owns it and the person who might find it if you lose it. Or for that matter, it could be anything. It could be the insurance company. It could be... Um, you know, a property manager, it could be anything. Uh, it doesn't even have to be the thing you own. It could be the thing you're responsible for. But it it basically gave, it was a way of giving things of all kinds, citizenship on the internet in a place that was also programmable. Um, and I, I love that idea. And I'm still waiting for that to take off. Do you have any ideas why this is not, I mean, to me, if I was your age or something like it, I would start a business around this. Like tomorrow, if I, to me, it's the most potentiated thing I can think of. Why isn't it? Why isn't it a big thing? So, uh, I mean, I can wonder. One of the mm. things that, um, one of the things uh, maybe is that the folks, all the folks that have been involved in this particular project, there's there's been similar projects of of different types and and mostly in product form where people are trying to sell this. Um, rather than develop a, a technology necessarily uh, or a standard, is that uh, we all keep looking at the next thing. We all keep uh, imagining what it might be if we just fixed that next thing or that next technology or we finished that next spec and then we we're able to add that in there. And so part of it, I think, is just that um, we've been involved in creating some, some st uh, related technologies and hasn't really pushed it. Um, the, the magical thing about Picos is that uh, they're like VMs, but in the most efficient way possible. If you imagine uh, like a, 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 you know, a tag on a backpack or, or a, a bike, it might get interacted with a couple times a year. And so in that sense, it's not worth running some sort of persistent VM somewhere that's just going to be uh, waiting for someone to, to send it a message or to interact with it. And so Picos are designed specifically in the Pico engine to um, require very little uh, at rest resources for non active um, uh, for not uh, that's not actually the Pico computing is not quite the right thing. Uh, Pico Labs is the is probably the thing yeah, you want to Google. Pico Labs .io. I, right. Yeah. And uh, and so so P, the Pico engine is really good at uh, serializing the state of of the Pico of of that of that compute object um, and then and then rehydrating it upon an inbound interaction. Uh, there you go. And so uh, that makes it quite efficient for things that you might interact with in a very infrequent way. Um, and so finding something lost is is uh, one example of doing this. Uh, other examples uh, might be um, recording information about the thing. Uh, so let's say you have a lawnmower and you keep having to find technical details about the lawnmower, like the, which spark plug it takes or, uh, or, or, or details like that, you know, which air filter. Um, and so it also gives you a place, uh, you know, you stick a sticker on your, on your lawnmower and you could record that kind of information, uh, on the, uh, inside the Pico for the lawnmower, which means the next time you need to go replace the spark plug, uh, you can scan it quickly, retrieve that information and then, and then know exactly what you need. So there's a handful of use cases, uh, lost items is one, uh, recording information or maintenance history, uh, about things could be another one. Um, imagine, uh, 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 you know, tagged uh, books. Uh, if you lent a book to a friend, you could note which friend you lent it to and then uh, be able to retrieve that information. Even if you didn't have the book, you could, you know, look it up in your list of things and, uh, and keep track of where you might have uh, shared it out to. There's a, I, I think that there's a, just part of the, part of the monstrously large potential for this is that we have here a conduit for communications between um, not only between people who have an interest in a thing, but especially like for customer service, for, for, you know, you buy a, you buy a camera, you buy a disc drive, you buy something that you use. Um, and it would be really helpful to the company that made it or that sold it to know how, not just how you're using it so they can market at you, which is sort of the default crappy assumption that companies make, but rather, what kind of intelligence are you gathering about what breaks, what, what knobs break off this thing? What, what, what rubber, this is a big one. I have a lot of old disk drives laying around that were made 
the cases where this kind of black rubber that literally turns into goo, you can't even touch it without getting gunk on your fingers. And somebody hadn't really researched that or thought that out when they put that on there. Um, but it could be a conduit for communications, asynchronous communications between co uh, customers and companies. And asynchronous communications really scales well. A, a guest on here about a year ago, Hadrian Sbarsha, talked about that, that asynchronous messaging, um, it's worked fantastically well with email, which is a simple, a really simple standard. This should be one, I think, for, for that. I don't want to dwell on it too long because we've got a lot of other things to talk about. But I think it's worth looking into. But you, you've, you're actually not working on that right now, are you? You're kind of moved on to other stuff. I'm not. So the um, giving objects uh, the ability to be a first class citizens on the Internet uh, highlighted the fact that um, that we've entered a world where people aren't really first class citizens on the Internet anymore either. And mostly by accident. Um, there's some uh, some nefarious aspects of that, but but mostly by accident. Um, with the invention of the API. Uh, APIs have been fantastic for systems integration and, and creating stuff um, that, uh, that spans um, silos. Um, the downside of an API is that you have to have a, a persistent, uh, relatively highly available uh, online presence to host an API. And most people don't. Uh, you know, people host blogs and, and self-host some things, but the vast majority of us regular human beings on the internet don't self-host things, um, which means that uh, we as people somewhere in the middle of Web 2.0 sort of became not first class citizens on the Internet anymore. Uh, we could only communicate with each other through other platforms. Email is a nice notable exception that has persisted for a long time. I'm glad it's still around. Um, but uh, if all the social media and, and all the other stuff all happens kind of other places. And I know there's lots of projects working on that. But um, one of the other things I've been uh, involved in pretty deeply is something we call DIDCOM, uh, which is short for DID Communication. Uh, DID itself, i got to explain the acronyms all the way down, is, um, is uh, short for Decentralized Identifiers. And there's a DID spec at the W3C. Um, that describes this uh, uh, a standard for decentralized identifiers. DIDCOM is built on top of that as a way of communicating with an owner of a DID. Um, and uh, it, it turns out to be message-based uh, and, and asynchronous, which gets back to the advantages that uh, you were talking about earlier, Doc. Excellent. So, I mean, that's... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Sam, go on. No, that's it. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Okay. No problem. Um, yeah, I, I was, I've been, you kindly sent us some videos and some uh, information about DIDs, which I have to be honest, I didn't know a lot about. That wasn't supposed to be a joke. Uh, I didn't know a lot about, to be honest. Um, so you've kind of explained it a bit there, but what are the use cases for, for DIDs and di what made you choose them for DIDCOM and all this kind of stuff? I know you work with a lot of other people. Um, Oh, here we go. We're going we're, for the people who are listening. We're we're getting to see some of the video that I watched earlier. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about Didcom. It seems to me like it's a kind of underlying secure layer that you can build things on top of. Would that be a fair assumption? That's totally fair. Uh, before we get into Didcom, it's worth talking about Dids. Um, one of the problems that we've had on the internet is that the identifiers that we have are all issued by someone that has control over them. And this is mm -hmm. mostly true uh, in the real physical world as well. Uh, but uh, for example, um, even an email address has this problem. Um, unless I self-host my email, I usually, you know, I'm, my email address, for example, is telegramsam at gmail.com. Google, who runs Gmail, could decide that they want to revoke that identifier and take that account away from me, and they can, and I can't really do a lot about it. And um, and so that's a problem. Um, it's particularly a problem for identity all over the place because my identity is tied generally to the platform that it's on. Um, so uh, within Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or something, um, that's how people know me and or could figure out how to get in contact with me. And so DIDS is an attempt to allow for identifiers that don't have some of the same limitations. Um, many DID methods anchor that information to a blockchain. Not all do, but some do. Um, and the nice part about that is that once it's anchored to a chain, that can be found. Uh, and, and even a whole blockchain itself uh, could be archived. I'm not talking about something like Bitcoin, but like an identity specific uh, ledger could be archived and still useful, even if the network itself isn't being hosted in a normal form anymore. And so the advantage there is that if I have an identifier that is more persistent and I have control over, um, then 
uh, then that becomes something to, to build on that's a more solid foundation than something like an email address or some other identifier that's been issued by, uh, by some platform. Um, the unfortunate realities of the, of the internet technology is that if a company can't figure out a way to make money hosting some platform, it tends to go away. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we have things that we wish lasted a long time that, that, that don't because, um, you know, a business model changes or someone makes a decision that that's not something they're going to support anymore. And so the, 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 the technology of a DID is relatively simple. DIDs are a little like IP addresses in the sense that uh, normal people are never supposed to see them. Um, but uh, when you have a DID, uh, it's uniquely identified and you can resolve that to something called a DID document. And the document doesn't contain very much, but what it does contain is, is highly useful. Um, it contains public keys and it also contains service endpoints. And one of those service endpoints can be uh, a DIDCOM endpoint. And then the, the keys that are present um, can, can be used for both signing and encryption. And so DIDCOM uses um, the most common uh, key type used in it is uh, ED25519 keys, um, which, uh, and, and, and then you can actually, uh, if, if two parties know each other's DIDs, then you can uh, encrypt messages to each other uh, and do useful things on top of it. And you're right that it, this is designed as a platform to build interesting things on top of rather than like an end thing all by itself. Yeah, so that that's one of the things I, I picked up earlier when I was doing a little bit of research on it. I noticed when you go to the DIDCOM site, which uh, Ant is currently showing us on the screen, uh, it, uh, it lets you search for protocols or get a list, if you want, just of protocols that have been built on top of it. So what's the adoption been like with this? Of, of people, have you had lots of interest in people putting their protocols or making protocols to go on top? It's beginning. A lot of the early focus has been on verifiable credentials, so protocols for issuing or, or presenting a verifiable credential. And that's a, a great use case for it, but certainly not the only use case for it. Um, the um, I this is relatively young as a technology. Uh, uh, so um, the as a bit of a status, uh, Didcom, what we've called Didcom V1, the, that uh, spec was created in the Hyperledger Aries community. There was enough interest in it um, that we have. Uh, we started a working group at the Decentralized Identity Foundation to work on version two. And that just like a week and a half ago um, reached a working group approved status. So it's very close to becoming ratified by the by the diff. And then it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a fixed spec to develop to. Um, uh, Didcom V2 is is simpler, I believe, in 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 most ways, uh, which is great for adoption. When you can make something better by making it simpler, that's a that's a good thing. And uh, and there's been a lot of interest in people waiting for that version to be finished before they uh, continue to build on it. So I think that uh, I think we're likely to see an uptick in in that adoption. Um, it's uh, Didcom V1 is already deployed in production applications, uh, mostly around identity and verifiable credentials. Um, so there's been good adoption, but I, I think we've just barely gotten started with the, the types of potential it has. Mm -hmm. One of the differences in Didcom is that um, a company or a service uh, has a DID and a, a Didcom endpoint, and so does a person. And uh, the messages are, it's a message uh, architecture and it's asynchronous uh, by design, which means that if all I have is a smartphone or all I have is a laptop and neither one of those are necessarily connected all the time or able to receive messages, um, through the use of relays we call mediators uh, that are that are mostly untrusted, uh, you can receive messages and interact the same way that an online service can. Um, and the hope there in that design is that it promotes architectures which return people to being first class citizens on the internet. Because we, we now have the sort of the same method of interacting uh, with each other and we can uh, engage in all sorts of, of protocols and things on top of that um, that get sort of all the batteries included, security features and, and, and other sort of routing behavior, et cetera, that, that are uh, designed into the DIDCOM core layer itself. So, so um, I have a question um, that follows that. It has to do with SSI, um, which we've covered a lot on the show. And we also have something coming from the back channel too, I think. But first, I want to let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. There are a lot of training programs you could go to. The question is, do they have the most up-to-date content? You can get the best possible IT training and certifications with IT Pro TV. Get training and certified on your own schedule with their virtual labs and practice tests. You'll always be supported and prepared for your exams. Binge episodes in up to 20 or 30 minute increments. They have over 5,800 hours 
of IT training that is always up to date with the most current content, which is important in this fast paced world. One reviewer says, most engaging hosts I've ever watched. I highly recommend IT Pro TV to not only IT professionals, but also to people who have interest in IT, but don't know where to start. Very educational and entertaining. Check out one of their newest courses, CompTIA A Plus Core 1 and Core 2 series, designed for professionals who support today's core technologies from security to networking to virtualization. CompTIA's A Plus certification is an industry standard for launching IT careers in today's digital world. Learn about hardware, operating systems, networking, security, and troubleshooting. IT Pro TV will have two free live webinars this month for you to check out. All Things Cybersecurity is one. Hacking Your Way into the Field with Daniel Lowry and Zach Hill, Thursday, June 16th at 2 p.m. That's Eastern Time. The Future of Project Management is the second one with Chris Ward and Kelly Mack, Thursday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget about your IT team. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use the code twit30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Okay, so so Sam, we've had uh, your your former boss and mentor, Phil Windley, on here at least a couple times, had Kalia Hamlin on. I'm sorry, Kalia Young. She's been Kalia Young for some time, better known as Identity Woman um, than by any surname. Um, Talking SSI, talking did did come. Um, what's the what's the overlap there? Did did I, did SSI as an idea come along first? Did verifiable credentials as an idea come along first? What how did how did these things all fit together? Because there, there are a lot of overlapping conversations here. There's there's a lot of overlapping conversations, and the timelines are not always clean. The concept of a verifiable yeah. credential has existed before uh, self-sovereign identity as a concept has kind of existed, um, but they send, they tend to cluster together because they're they're highly similar. Um, credentials allow you to make trust portable in a way that's really useful for self-sovereign identity because uh, the holder of the credential is often the subject, and they get to decide when they're going to present a credential and when not to. And so this involves them as a as a major participant in interactions instead of being the subject of some interaction happening without their involvement. And so the uh, the concepts blend together quite well. Um, Didcom itself grew uh, out of a necessity to communicate between what we originally called identity agents. Um, and we still use the term a uh, agent a lot. Uh, and, and the Aries project within Hyperledger is, is focused on uh, uh, building agents that speak did come and do things like exchange verifiable credentials and also other interesting identity things. And so um, the I don't know the exact timeline of most of that, but they, the, those concepts cluster together quite well uh, just because of the sort of the benefits that they provide in making that happen. They're all also sort of similar in that the technology has grown and, and it's now very capable, but uh, it still needs more adoption in order to really apply the benefits of all of it to the, to the, the Internet as a whole. So for, for people not familiar with SSI and just beginning to learn about DIDs and DIDCOM, um, verifiable credentials are actually what we present when we hand over our passport or a driver's license or a credit card or a membership card uh, or a ticket to a concert or to a show. Um, that's a verifiable credential. And, and that's in the physical, ordinary world. And we take this stuff for granted. The problem in the digital world is that um, what what a relying party, which is the, the party requesting that somebody present a credential needs, is generally pretty contained. I only need to know you've got an you've got a, a ticket to the show, that you're over eighteen, that you can come in here, that you're a, a citizen of this country, you're licensed to drive, um, and we don't want to leak all kinds of additional information. We also think reasonably, I think that. The individual should be the responsible party for deciding who gets to find out what. And 
the hard thing, I think, Sam, and you could correct me on this, about spinning, spinning this up is getting kind of coordinated adoption by everybody, including the ordinary citizens walking around who will now have something like digital wallets. And there are many of those. I've got a bunch of them on my phone. I don't use any of them yet. Um, I just ran across one yesterday that wants me to join a club. Um, and then, you know, they're, I guess they're using Didcom and some other um, standard ways of communicating, but, but you want to be in their club before you start. I, and it, it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that either it is an app on your phone or it's something that with near field or some other method, we just whap on somebody when they want to know, you know, are you, are you, do you have a ticket to the show? You don't even need to present anything. You just go in because you're wearing something that lets you in or your, um, your TSA pre, let's say you, you just get in the line, you know, somebody doesn't have to check it by looking at something. So that is a kind of verifiable credential. I mean, there's all kinds of, each of these things are generally called in the, in the business a ceremony, but we're trying to change everybody's ceremony all at once. And I'm wondering, is there one particular kind of ceremony that stands out for you is maybe this is the use case that's going to get people to adopt this and companies to adopt it because both have to happen. So there's a couple. Um, we've seen, um, I, I work for a company called the DCO and they do uh, uh, consulting services uh, along this vein for, for lots of folks. And the uh, one of the main areas of adoption that we've seen is with travel. Um, this was starting to happen before COVID. COVID became a focus for a while and now it's sort of back to the previous goals um, of, of reducing friction in the, in the travel industry. Um, there's a handful of, of uh, opportunities to save money there. Um, one of them, uh, for example, is that um, if an airline uh, um, uh, transports a person to a destination that they're not going to be accepted into, let's say a foreign country and they don't have a visa or something, um, or they don't have a valid uh, passport, then it's the airline's responsibility to transport that person back uh, to wherever they came from. And the airlines don't like to do this, of course. Uh, they want to get paid for all their flights. And so um, there, there's, uh, there's a huge desire to automate that process. And so I think travel is one of them. <clears throat> the other thing uh, it, it's going to be a little awkward to mention, and I'll explain why. Um, logs and passwords are like a persistent uh, topic of realization that something is terrible and we should do something better. And I think that decentralized identity and self-sovereign identity have a, a, a huge opportunity there. The reason it's awkward is that um, it's, it's easy for folks to look at that and understand that all you're trying to do is fix the password problem. And, and the password problem gets fixed, but almost by accident. If you have a, a better digital relationship with a party on the internet, then the fact that you know who they are or that they've authenticated is kind of a byproduct of the main thing which you have, which is a better digital relationship. And so the way to make passwords better, I think, is, is, is not to improve passwords so much, but, but make the fact that you know who you're talking to or that this is the same person that you talked to last time, even if you know limited information about the contact, um, that, uh, that we solve that problem. And then the need for passwords actually kind of goes away. And so those are two areas that I think are, are really ripe for doing this. Um, the, the digital relationship thing goes beyond passwords, of course. Um, if I am trying to communicate with uh, another company or my bank or, um, you know, a customer service center, uh, then having a better digital relationship uh, through these technologies um, solves uh, authentication, not just online, but maybe on the phone. Um, if we can have better digital relationships than, than, uh, than pr pretending to be someone else at a call center and gaining access to their private information or changing something about their account becomes something that, that, that is much, much harder to do, not because we've like solved passwords, but because we've, we've improved digital relationships and how they work. So, Sam, what do you think about uh, Fido and some of the things that Google, Microsoft and Apple are now talking about to do away with passwords? Do you think the, the it's a good start? Companies, uh huh. I mean, it's it's a good start, but I, I think that they're trying to solve the surface level problem without really getting into the depth of improving uh, digital relationships as a whole. So I applaud their efforts. I think they're going to be really useful. And this is not a scenario where decentralized identity and, and self sovereign identity are going to like suddenly take over the world. It's going to get adopted alongside a lot of these other technologies. And so I think that that Fido is fantastic for that. Um, but that they're not quite going deep enough. And I think that we can do better with, with better digital relationships. 
Yeah. Makes to- makes total sense. And we have a couple of uh, our chat room is buzzing away today, as always. And we have a couple of questions for you, which people have been waiting for us to get to. So apologies to the people who've been waiting. But I'll actually ask you them both together because I think they're kind of related, pretty much, to be honest. So Jojo Dancer uh, asks us when we were talking about dids, this was um, who issues the dids? Is it permanent for a user? Can they take it away from us? Should we buy one? Which is interesting. And Gumby, who says, uh, I'm late to the party, but what is the process for dead dids, i.e., what happens when you want to revoke one or abandon it? Um, so let me start with dead dids. Um, mm-hmm. You, if you want to stop using an identifier, you just can. You just use other identifiers in their place. Um, and I'll, in a second, I'll talk about why that's not as inefficient as it sounds. Um, the um, getting a did is a is a process not of getting someone to give you one, but rather of registering a did. Practically speaking, because humans are bad at doing cryptography in our heads, we have to use software to do this. And so you're gonna uh, use an app, for example, that will uh, that will help you get dids. And I say dids on purpose, not just one, um, because there's a, a huge number of, of um, useful cases where you wanna have hundreds or thousands of these things um, so that you can avoid correlation um, with the different folks that you're talking to. If I talk with one friend, I can use uh, one did, and a different friend gets a different one. And, and now uh, there's some additional security advantages of doing so um, and privacy advantages uh, of, of having different ones. Um, you're not gonna have to think about this. Uh, software is gonna help you do this. If you have software that can speak uh, didcom and use dids, et cetera, then it can help you uh, create dids uh, even on the fly and automatically d- during its operation. Um, one of the did methods that's my favorite is actually called a peer did. And uh, the peer dids are designed to work the same way that normal dids do, only rather than registering your did or, or having it recorded on the ledger, then you just pass it to the other party that you're actually directly interacting with. And the, the advantage there is that it's very cheap because the, the, the fastest and the cheapest ledger write is no ledger write. Um, and mm-hmm. and now all the other parties that need that did actually have that information from you. And so um, when you stop using a peer did, uh, then like it just vanishes and, and there's very little overhead that was there in the first place. And so there's not really a cost to abandoning it. Most organizations or, um, or, or uh, or businesses, et cetera, will probably want a ledger recorded did for there's a handful of advantages in those cases, and they don't have the same privacy needs that individuals do. So, mm-hmm. um, so you get one by uh, by generating a private key that only you know, and um, you're doing this with software, of course, and then you get the did registered on a ledger. And, and each did method has its own method of doing so. Some are anchored to Bitcoin, some directly, some are, are anchored via something called a side tree, uh, which is a popular technology. It may be written directly to a ledger, um, not for people, but for organizations uh, like Hyperledger Indy, which is an identity focused ledger specifically for that. So um, you get one by using software that helps you use them is, is the short answer. Um, and the ability to abandon them uh, and, to, and to, to shed them like that is actually part of the design uh, from a personal privacy perspective, um, because uh, then you, you, don't, uh, you don't have a persistent identifier that's used as a magic super cookie to track you everywhere. Excellent. That's it. Thanks for the explanation. Um, I hope that if, if people can ask us in the chat if you want to know more, but hopefully that uh, clears some of that up. It seems to me a lot of this is, um, it feels a lot to me like um, the way we used to do things with encrypted email and so on, where we, you know, we, we'd have key signing parties and we'd have a web of trust and all that kind of stuff. And where you'd have um, you'd have your private key and your public key and you would, you know, it, the web of trust would expand as different people verified who was who. But in this case, you don't have one canonical key, as you're saying, you, you're going to use peer peer dids, as you called them. So you'll have lots of different keys. So you're not going to be doing that. I assume you wouldn't be doing that thing of, of go into like sign key signing parties and stuff. I know that's probably not related, but do you get what, I, no, what I'm saying there? I, I do. And it's totally related. The, mm-hmm. um, if you look at uh, dids, for example, this is just a, a, a different spin, if you will, on PKI, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got public keys and private keys. How do we share them? How do we coordinate activities? And, and you're, mm-hmm. they're totally they're totally similar. Um, the, the key signing parties and having your key well known was, uh, was an activity that made a lot of sense when the internet was relatively small and we hadn't really evolved to the point where um, surveillance capitalism was such a a popular activity, right, uh, on the internet. And so uh, it, it, in today's day and age, we still have the same problem, but we need to approach it a little bit differently. And um, there, the, the combination of dids and credentials even can be used 
Um, but in a little bit more of a private way. For example, if if I know Doc and if Doc introduced me to you, then Doc can assert to me over the trusted connection that I have with him that, that uh, things about you, like the name that he knows you by, for example. And and that types of uh, that type of introduction serves a lot of similar uh, roles to the point where I have some trust because of my trust in Doc, and then and then as he introduces me to you, then 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 some of that trust is going to transfer, um, and now I I can be you know sure of the connection that I have with you, and so I think that uh, all the same stuff the, the 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 technology itself is not very new, but we're trying to give it abilities that it hasn't had previously that hopefully overcome some of the reasons why the previous technology was not as widely deployed as, as we had all hoped. And so it, it, if it feels like a new spin on an old thing, then, you, the, then you're mostly right. But this isn't because we're forgetting history, but because we're trying to solve the problems that history was unable to solve. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, and and we won't have to line up for hours at places like Fosden with our passports, I suppose. So there is that, <laughs> There's that yeah. adventure. Indeed. Although there was a certain enjoyment to that in some way. Um, uh, as well. And of course, then we're just reducing, we're going back to the passport again, which we talked about before. That was our, you'd have to trust me that I, you know, I hadn't forged my passport um, or something and I hadn't stuck another picture on it. Um, right. So I, I, this seems really exciting as, as an area and, and did come on this messaging platform that you've got. What are some of the, uh, are, are there any really kind of interesting um, applications that you've seen built with this so far? And what what what's exciting that, that, you'd, that you're really excited by people are doing with it? Um, so I've, I've seen some in travel uh, has been really powerful. Um, we did as a company, we did a, a, an interaction with the island of Aruba. Um, they wanted to change the way that um, that folks arrived, and 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 so working with some some partners there. CETA was one of the airline uh, the, the the airline industry partners that uh, that we worked with there. But um, the idea was is to eliminate all of the pain in the lines that happen when you get there. If you can pre-prove things about you. Um, and then when you arrive, all you have to do is 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 prove that you are the person that the same person that pre-proved things. Then you can whisk right through. Um, Doc mentioned earlier the ability to you know to send something on you and you just can like walk through. Um, it did come itself as transport agnostic in the sense that it doesn't derive its security from the transport being used. So uh, it uses HTTPS and, and, and WebSockets, but it can also be used over NFC and Bluetooth. Um, that those aren't as widely developed and, and common in the community as I uh, as I want yet, but we're working on that. And the idea here is is that um, I might be approaching some um, some uh, you know a, a security thing, you know, uh, customs in a country or or something border control, and mm -hmm. uh, if I've got my phone on me and I've authorized it to do so, it can detect the presence, uh, uh, the, the BLE endpoint, uh, Bluetooth low energy endpoint of a, of a device there at the, at the border checkpoint, it can discover that DIDCOM is a supported thing by both of the, uh, my device and that device, and then can engage in some interactions. And rather than just forking over my personal information, what it can do first is ask the other side to prove that it is what it says it is. So let's say I'm at, I'm at the Canadian border just to pick up a, a border. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, I can receive proof that that is in fact an authorized uh, Canadian uh, checkpoint according to the government of Canada. There, there's always a, a sort of a chain of trust that you have to follow there. And then when I uh, when I receive that information, I can see if it satisfies my need for knowing who they are. Then I can provide the, the that information over that connection, and that can happen in a pre-approved manner, uh, particularly if I'm a frequent traveler, such that um, I still have control over that as a, as a user, but I may have authorized it to happen in an automated fashion. And, and now when I get to uh, up to there, I can do a really quick check so that they know that I am in fact the person who just uh, used a Bluetooth connection to, to provide information, and now I can breeze right through security. And so there's, uh, there's a couple of advantages there. One, it's way easier uh, from a user experience perspective but the other advantage that's often hidden is that I'm authenticating the other side just as much as they're authenticating me. So this is a mutual interaction rather than the semi one-sided one. Now in the, in the physical world, this is often handled by the fact that if there's a, a, a border security guard at the Canadian border from Canada, right? And I'm going into Canada, like the, their presence at the border implies that they are in fact the, the authorized party to do so. But in uncertain circumstances, Sometimes you might not have the confidence that it is, in fact, an authorized person at the border. And so there's advantages of involving the technology, even in the real world, to make that happen. Um, the other 
advantage of that is that you can reveal just enough information. Um, the classic example here is that if I show my ID when I enter a bar to prove that I'm over uh, the, the required age, um, my, my driver's license has lots more information than just my age on it that I might not want to reveal. Now, if I show it to a person, human memory being mostly faulty, they're unlikely to remember everything on the, on the ID card. But in an electronic sense, computers remember really well. And so I, the technology, one of the technologies that we use is called the non-creds, and it has the ability to do predicate proofs. So I can, for example, prove to you that I am born after or before a certain date without actually revealing what the date is. And that's, a, that's hugely beneficial um, because now the computer system that just received that information doesn't know my birth date. It just knows that I'm older than a certain age with, with assurance, right? It, it's sure that I'm older than a certain age, but it didn't uh, obtain any information other than what I wanted. And so uh, that's good for two reasons. It's good for the individual because we have more privacy. It's good for the, for the recipient of the information uh, because of the liability of holding all of that information to, to start with. Um, uh, there's uh, growing um, uh, collections of laws in various jurisdictions uh, requiring companies to um, to manage data in, in particular ways. And the easiest way to safeguard data that you receive from customers is to not receive the data from customers. And so if you gain just the assurance that you need and then um, and, and not any extra, then you can avoid a whole bunch of data liability and, and problems in your in your in your your data processing lifecycle. Mm. That's that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it from that perspective, as you say, with the GDPR and all these other things that we're dealing with now uh, over uh, keeping people's uh, data safe. So if you don't have it, you can't accidentally, you know, give it away. I suppose that's very true. But on the flip side of that, it makes me think about so companies that um, work often and often in this space, like Google, Facebook, people like that, who do seem to want you to use them to sign into other things, which I have a real problem with but let's not get into that but they a lot of their business model is in knowing not just that you're over a certain age but in fact exactly how old you are so they can sell that information to somebody else or an advertiser say to an, a company such and such is this age they be in your key demographic for your product or whatever um do you think there's a conflict of interest there in some ways because it leads on a little bit from um there's a discussion going on in the chat at the moment which kind of made me think about this um eric duckman said uh it seems like the ship has sailed the big three of this is referring back to fido of course that we talked about a minute ago sorry to drag you back to that uh, but it seems as though this ship has sailed and the big three have decided on something and that's it whether we like it or not um do you think that is is there a conflict of interest there for some companies and do you think to some degree we're, we're stuck with what they decide to use uh somewhat um there's uh, there's a couple of technologies that have uh, been uh, created specifically to not require interaction of, of, the, of the big software vendors, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. I look at OpenID as one. Um, OpenID mm -hmm. was designed to work with existing web technologies, but provide something new on top of them. And there's no browser support required for OpenID, which is, the, which is by design, it's not an accident. And so there are other technologies, uh, even with verifiable credentials, that that you that that rely upon browser features. But you can do things in both ways. And so I, I see this as a multi-pronged attach. Number one, I, th I think FIDO is a good step forward. Um, the fact that it's actually standards-based is is a benefit. Um, sometimes Apple has the habit of inventing things and then kind of not sharing them. And I'm glad in this case it's actually uh, FIDO is being used. Um, it's also a recognition that, that things change and improve over time. Um, I think that uh, FIDO is a nice step forward. Um, I think that uh, the, the the stuff we've been talking about, you know, decentralized identity and, and SSI and DIDCOM and, and better digital relationships is another step forward beyond that. And that can be adopted either with their involvement or without their involvement. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what mobile apps support and what they don't support is a constant piece of discussion uh, around how we sort of work with those things. Um, in particular, there's some things that it would be um, really nice uh, if Apple supported that they don't. And I'm talking about like uh, deep linking in, in a way that's that's generic to apps. Um, there, uh, right now, um, uh, the iOS linking to an application works if you host a website and an associated app, but it doesn't work very well if you have a brand new protocol that you're trying to allow any app to pick up. For example, that's a change that we would love them to make that they haven't yet. Um, 
but uh, but more or less we're we're figuring our way through that and so the, we're going to this technology will be rolling out even without their direct involvement i suspect at some point if we're successful and i, I hope we are then they will need to adopt and and add official support for some of this at some point um but uh, but we're not uh we're not waiting for that day we're still making uh, progress and doing some really interesting things um independent of their direct support so part of it yeah they've adopted fido but we don't have to wait. We, we can we mm -hmm. can do cool stuff now. Mm -hmm. well, I just learned a whole bunch of stuff about Fido I didn't know, and that's cool. Um, there's a, but I I, I want to. We have limited time, and I want to get on to your your itinerant life. But first, because it's really interesting <laughs> stuff. But first, I want to let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Net Foundry. Networking has traditionally been handled by dedicated teams and personnel. You could say network security has been deemed too important to leave in the hands of developers. One of our sponsors, NetFoundry, believes differently. Secure connectivity is too important to be taken away from developers and has forced dependency and stifled innovation and business velocity or unnecessary trades off security for those benefits. Therefore, NetFoundry created and maintains Open ZT, that's Open ZITI, providing an open source, free and easy way for the world to embed zero trust networking into anything. It provides everything you need to spin up a truly private zero trust overlay network in minutes across anything directly in your app, on any device, or in any cloud, built on principles of extensibility, flexibility, and scalability. Attacks from insecure networks can become a thing of the past. External network attacks, including DDoS attacks, brute force, credential stuffing, CVE or zero-day exploits, BGP hijacks, phishing, and more can be stopped. This is truly zero trust of all networks. No need for expensive and risky reactive patching. Agnostic design patterns ensure you only need commodity internet with outbound ports without needing networking engineering skills to implement it. Say goodbye to complex firewall rules, inbound ports, public DNS, static network access controls, and VPNs. Spring 4 Shell, that's Spring number 4 Shell, and Windows, RPC, RCE, are recent exploits, CVEs. The recommendation is to cloud inbound ports, but OpenZD allows you to have no inbound ports at all. OpenZD was mentioned in Java Magazine about how they ZD-fied the Spring Boot for any Java app. Moral to the story, those who make themselves dark cannot be exploited by Spring for Shell or other network attacks. Eliminate the tug of war between developers and security. The former can work programmatically with software while the latter have isolated apps driven by policy, visibility, and logs they require. Zero trust is a journey, so start wherever you need based on your priorities. OpenZD offers numerous SDKs tunneling apps for popular OSs and edge routers in cloud marketplaces. If you don't want to host OpenZD, use the NetFoundry SaaS, including free forever tiers for up to 10 endpoints. Head to netfoundry.io slash twit to grab some free swag, learn more, and get started. That's netfoundry.io slash twit and get your free swag and free tier now. Okay, so Sam, you spent a lot of your, at least your adult life, as far as I know, on the road. I know from having tried to get a hold of you at different times, it's been, you know, I may not be where there's connectivity. I'm out of my RV. I think you have a wind, a wind stream, right? You tow, you or at least you tow to so an airstream, an airstream around, trailer. Right? Yeah, an airstream we trailer, did. and you've got, and you've got a wife and how many kids? Three, three kids, four, three kids. And you homeschooled them as well. Is that right? Do I have that right? Uh, yes, particularly at the time. We we're, Now we're doing a balance of homeschool and, and regular enrollment. But uh, yeah. So, okay. So tell me, well, you can tell me about that life anyway, but how that works with geekery and, and keeping up with GitHub and all the communication required, you know, on, on the road. And how's that, how, how did that go and how does that go for you? Even so still? it, um, so it, it's a little different now, and I can I can explain. But uh, this was about between 2013 and 2017. 
Um, we started with a, a house swap um, and we went to Virginia and the people that lived in Virginia came to live in our house at the, at the time that was in Utah. And, uh, and we did that um, for six months and had a great time. And then in the middle of that, uh, decided that, um, that traveling full time would be something that, that we think would be good for our family. And so we, we bought an Airstream trailer. Uh, and a and a truck we had driven a minivan loaded to the gills out to to Virginia with you know bikes and everything on it. And at the time our kids were um, our three kids were aged between three and eight, um, so relatively young. <laughs> and um, we uh, we went uh, we we traveled uh, full time um, for about the next four and a half or five years. Um, and what that meant was is that uh, maybe once or twice a week we would move to someplace else. We would uh, we spent a lot of time in state and national parks and, and visiting other places like that. Um, and we'd be someplace for a couple of days and explore, integrate that into our, our homeschooling or road schooling we called it uh, during travel. And then uh, and then we would move to another place. And so our average. Um, trip, uh, our average move distance per time we moved is only about 100 miles. Um, when you think about it, 100 miles from wherever you are right now is someplace pretty different. And so we uh, we traveled over all over the United States um, uh, over the years that we were doing that. Um, we ended up um, for four months in Hawaii. We didn't take the Airstream, of course, there. Um, and so uh, I had an, an opportunity to teach an adjunct class at a university there. And, and uh, so we went and did that for four months um, and a variety of other uh, of other things along the, along the way. Um, the interesting part is that back in 2013, uh, so Starlink is the new hotness, and they actually have an RV um, uh, plan that that is is fantastic because it gets you connections in places where uh, cell networks don't. Um, back in in 2013, you're a lot more limited. Uh, we still had good cell networks for reasonable reasonable prices, but um, it, uh, it it's still a little bit of a challenge. And sometimes we'd want to be someplace that we didn't have cell signal, so we had to plan ahead for that. Um, at the time, I was doing mostly software development work, and so I only had about uh, one or two meetings a week with with my team or with clients, and that worked really well for a traveling uh, lifestyle. I would uh, get up early and and get a lot of work done uh, before the day happened, and then as as the kids were schooling, and then usually by mid afternoon or so, we could um, uh, we could be about exploring and and doing the things that we wanted to do together as a family. Um, now uh, I have a uh, a lot more calls and, and coordinated stuff that m would make that much more difficult. And so we're actually, um, we landed, uh, we started in Utah and ended up selling our house there. And then we landed in Idaho. Um, I live in Driggs, Idaho, which is just over the uh, Wyoming border from Jackson Hole. And so um, we're, we're here now. Um, we've been here for the, a couple of years. We bought a condo and we're in the final stages of actually building a house. Um, that I'm actually sitting in now, um, and uh, and we're we're within a week, hopefully, of of our final inspections on that particular house that we're that we're building. So we don't travel very much anymore, um, and because our kids are older now, uh, future adventures are likely to look very different than the ones in the past. But but uh, that that time that we spent traveling was uh, wonderful as a family, and actually worked surprisingly well. Uh, being a nerd on the road, as long as I could, uh, I had all the tricks. I had antennas and cell boosters. Um, and, and, and things to be able to get signal in lots of places. And uh, that provided a, a wonderful life for our family for, for those number of years. And in 17, then, you would have been there for the eclipse, would you not? Somewhere in Wyoming or, or Idaho? We actually had already bought our condo by then, but we were renting it out. Um, uh, we put it on Airbnb and then we parked the, our trailer. And my my brother also lives here in, in the, the small valley that we live in. And so we parked our Airstream trailer in his backyard uh, for the eclipse that went right through. And we were pretty close to the center line. Um, and so we had we had a lot of a lot of totality, which was very fun. So so. Um, you get to look at the, well, actually I was in, in the middle of Wyoming at the same time. So not, not too far as the crow flies, but over the Tetons, um, and the wind rivers too, I think. Um, so you have a wonderful view of the Tetons at sunset then, I imagine from where you are. We do. Am I guessing right? And yeah. We, we really like, uh, outdoor stuff. Uh, we mountain bike and we hike and we, uh, and we paddle and, and all the things. And so, um, there's a lot he right here. Um, there, there is, of course, uh, the Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone, which has had some unfortunate flooding over the past couple of days that's really going to foul up, uh, folks visiting for about the next year. But, um, we, um, there's a lot of stuff just within this valley itself, um, that we really like 
Yeah, enjoying and so there's there's a lot of mountain bike um, uh, stuff and summer activities in the winter there's a ski there's a, a ski hill that's actually in Wyoming but you can't get to it from Wyoming you have to get to it from Idaho um, called Grand Targhee um, that is here um, and then um, they do fat bike trails and, and, and Nordic grooming in the winter and so we, we enjoy all of the seasons as they come. I, I was gonna say I mean you you live with a scenic climax I mean and not like not like Utah is short on those things, but I think well, the Tetons. People, and... so, sometimes <laughs> I mention that uh, we live in a small place and, and <laughs> it's, I'm not sure which is shocking. The fact that the, that the city I live in has one stoplight or that the entire county has two stoplights. <laughs> so it's a, it, it's a small place. And, and stopping may even be optional that if you're. <laughs> in, in a place like that. Um, well, you, so, you know it's tourist season because you get to the stoplight and there's cars in front of you. That's what tourist <laughs> season is. <laughs> um, so um, we're getting a bit short on time here. Um, I, I have a question that's unrelated to anything, but I just, I'll just throw it out there and then and then see if Dan has anyone left in the time we have. But where, where did Telegram Sam come from? Because Telegram Sam is your handle on Twitter and a bunch of other places that's on, on GitHub, uh, so where did that come from? So I've had people ask me if I'm a huge fan of the Telegram app, uh, and that uh, there's a un, that's an unfortunate timeline incident, right? I, I had Telegram <laughs> Sam as a screen name way before Telegram was a thing. Um, my uh, my dad owned a civil engineering business, and uh, and he um, uh, he. Uh, employed a, a, a guy named Mike who was a, a fan of obscure bands. And so one of his, the bands that he was a, uh, he was a fan of is, is Bauhaus and they have a song uh, called Telegram Sam. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, if you Google it up, you can find it. It's a, it's, it's some entertaining music. Anyway, uh, he would call me Telegram Sam. I was a, I was a kid at the time. I was I mean, uh, maybe eight or nine. And uh, and he would uh, he would like sing the Telegram Sam, you know, section of that song uh, when I would visit the office at times. And so when it came time to pick a um, a screen name, uh, you know, as I began getting involved in the Internet, uh, then uh, then Telegram Sam was a natural pick. One of the uh, regrets of my life is that I have failed to actually send a telegram with Western Union before Western <laughs> Union discontinued the telegram service in the United States. So I had Telegram Sam has unfortunately never actually sent a telegram. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I yeah. did not even know the telegrams had finally ended, though it makes some kind of sense. I was in college when they announced it, and I, I wish they had given me a month warning because I would have sent... <laughs> Uh, a likely humorous telegram to my parents from college, uh, just so that I could then have the record of doing so. Yeah. So, so we usually end up with, um, uh, with some questions. Uh, I mean, just some, some standard questions. The first, if you could answer very briefly, is there anything we haven't asked you that, that we should have, or you'd like to answer for just, well, there's a lot we could things. talk about. Um, yeah, there always is. I, I so there was one point that I wish I had made earlier, and if I could insert that now, um, please. The, yeah. People think about uh, if you want to think about Didcom and what how it applies in a useful way. Um, the probably the most succinct way that I can describe it is it's like peer to peer APIs. You can interact with other parties, but in a way that is designed to be peer to peer from the ground instead of having a client server modality to do so. And so, if you are looking for something like that, please take a look at Didcom. Oh, That's I love the, that. I love that. I mean, the, the peer to peer thing is really that that's why I didn't like, you know, I mean, what uh, I, I don't know which which one of our one of our uh, back channel says, well, the big guys are doing this and that. To me, it's like we're we're two seconds into the digital age and it's going to be real long and we're just figuring it out up front. And peer to peer is what it's about. And let's make that work. And I love that uh, uh, peer to peer APIs. Uh, next is. Um, what is your favorite text editor and scripting language? That's kind of our control. Oh question. gosh. So I'm a Python fan. Um, I, I find it to be highly readable. Um, and I know not everyone likes it, uh, but I, I was a fan of, of, uh, of uh, have been for a long time. Um, and, um, and for an editor, um, you know, I, um, I use a variety, um, this is not I'm not a diehard like an Emacs, uh, you know, uh, type guy. So I end up kind of using uh, mostly what's useful. And um, 
and the uh, the the latest Microsoft uh, round of editors has ended up being uh, probably the the most useful. Um, they they've uh, they've done a really pretty good job uh, pr- providing a platform that that's nice to use and, and doesn't sort of uh, force opinions on you about the technologies that you use. And so I enjoy those. So the VS Code. Sorry, I didn't name it. VS Code. Yeah, I actually I had a wonderful conversation with an ex Microsoft guy who we may have on the show. I don't want to name yet. Um, who talked about the fight for open source at Microsoft and when they kind of flipped on it. And uh, there's so much to that story. And, but that's part of it. That's an outcome. You know, I was wondering if you'd say Emacs only because you studied under Phil and Phil's an Emacs guy. <laughs> no, <laughs> so. I, uh, th- that didn't translate. To, in, in, in Phil's not the type to mandate a text editor. So no, he's <laughs> not. Translate. He's not the type to mandate anything. Just get, get the work done, which is very, very much the geek, the geek way of doing things, whatever it takes. Well, well, Sam, this has been awesome. It's been a great hour that went in about three minutes. <laughs> I was joking earlier on the back channel that you're not one of those people that somebody can like speed it up to one and a half uh, if they're listening on a podcast. <laughs> kind of, you kind of want to drop it down to point eight or point nine, but they don't. But they, most of them don't offer that. I don't know. They just you can speed it up and not slow it down except by half. Anyway, this is this is this is as I expected. Been really great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for being on. So, Dan, that was a whirlwind, huh? Yeah, what a great show. I mean, I know we've said it already, but we've both said it that uh, it really flew by in the back channel. We were saying there, you know, it doesn't feel like it's it's been that long. We could talk to Sam for ages, and that's that's. I hope that's a good sign. That's always usually a good sign of a good show. Time flies when you're having fun, for sure. Yeah, it's a. Uh, um, and I, I think I said I've, I've known Sam for a long time, and um, and mm. in, in geek in geek time, which is to say like twelve, fifteen years, something like that. Which you know, life as mm. long as mine isn't that long, but um, uh, it's uh, he's always interesting to talk to, and and always also ready to help. I've several times I've, I've called on him just to help me make sense of something, and he's had entirely constructive suggestions and. You know, he's a, he's, he's a helper, a born helper. And, uh, and that's just great. That's just great. Um, mm. I, I'm being to, to do something I almost never do, which is remember next week's guest. Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's going to be Dave Hughesby. Um, uh, and actually if anybody's interested in Dave, we've, or, I've, uh, Catherine Druckmann is going to be my co-host on that one. And she and I have talked to Dave a number of times on reality 2.0, which is our own little podcast. Um, uh, Dave is like Sam, um, uh, a frequenter of, uh, internet identity workshop, which I co-host or co-organize and just is really brilliant on a lot of topics. I think it's going to be a show a lot like this one. You don't want to miss it. So that is, that is coming up next week. So what do you got to plug there, Dan? I, I probably <laughs> should have saved that one, um, <laughs> until the very end, but what the heck I was looking at my, my no. prompt. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, one thing I the one thing I really want to plug this time is the uh, Liverpool Make Fest, which is an event that I've oh. uh, I've talked about in the past. It's uh, it's coming up again. It's an annual event. This is our first one for uh, because of the you know pandemic and all the rest of it. This is our first one since 2019, so we're really excited to be back. Uh, it's a big event. We have like yeah, I think there's about 60 different projects makers come in. Um, we have lots of people coming in during the day. It's at the library. It, it, so one of the big things about Makefest, which we've been running for a while and we've been trying to replicate around the country, is that we want them to be in libraries because libraries fit really well for this. It's a public space. Everyone can come in. It's part of the community. Um, and it works really well. So Liverpool Central Library, the 2nd of July, if you're in the UK or you, even if you can get to the UK, if you, if you, you know, we've got a few people coming from Northern Europe uh, coming over as well. So if you can get to the UK and you're interested uh, all day from 9am to 5pm, you can come in and you can find out about all the great projects people are making. Uh, we've got everything, you know, from uh, really high tech projects to uh, traditional kind of craft type projects where we've got people who are doing lace um 
lace sewing and stitching. Um, we've got people doing uh, painting and woodworking and all those kind of things, along with, of course, plenty of, of IoT stuff, uh, Raspberry Pis and micro bits and all those kind of things. And it's all completely free. So all you need to do is go to liverpoolmakefest.org, um, as Ant just kindly put up on the screen for us there. And you can find all the information. It's completely free. Just come down, get involved, make something, find out about some cool stuff. You never know. You might discover a new hobby that you didn't know that you were going to be into. That's fantastic. The Liverpool Make Fest. Mm -hmm. All one word, right? That's fun. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. Well, thanks a lot for being on the show, Dan, and uh, and and to Sam for this week's show. And uh, next week again, we have uh, Dave Hughesby coming on, and that's going to be a good one. I've had some practice with Dave, and he's always super smart and just has great angles and everything. So come see you next week. I'm Doc Searles. This has been Floss Weekly. Take it easy. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, editor of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I'm joined by Tarek Malik, the editor-in-chief over at Space.com. In our new This Week in Space podcast, every Friday, Tarek and I take a deep dive into the stories that define the new space age. What's NASA up to? When will Americans once again set foot on the moon? And how about those samples from the Perseverance rover? When are those coming home? What the heck has Elon Musk done now? In addition to all the latest and greatest in space exploration, we'll take an occasional look at bits of spaceflight history that you probably never heard of, and all with an eye towards having a good time along the way. Check us out in your favorite podcatcher.